All right, we're rolling the tape. Uh, welcome to our audiences as you filter into our virtual library. Uh, I'm Garrett Nelson from the MAP Center, and I'm here with to my Hi, left. Hi, I'm Rachel <laughs> We're just we're gonna chat just we're just gonna chatter a little bit while we wait for seven o'clock to roll around and people to filter into our uh, our virtual room here. But glad to see everyone tonight. Uh, we're tuning in from our remote secret map branch libraries uh, <laughs> and and uh, looking forward to being in East Boston virtually. We'll start at right at seven p.m. Uh, and we have some guests that we'll welcome and that we're gonna be talking maps and history, which is our favorite thing to talk about. The only thing that we talk about. <laughs> <laughs> pretty much, pretty much. To people who are just uh, filing into the room, uh, dropping your umbrellas, your virtual umbrellas and hanging up your virtual coats, uh, you could be watching us on YouTube or Facebook. It doesn't matter, same thing. Um, and. In either case, if you use the, the uh, comments um, box below the video, we'll, we should be able to see it. Um, so if you have any uh, feedback or questions as we talk. It looks like it is exactly 7.00.00, and we like to be uh, punctual around here. So welcome to our broadcast of East Boston by Map. Uh, I am Garrett Dash Nelson. I'm the Curator of Maps and Director of Geographic Scholarship at the Leventhal Map and Education Center at the Boston Public Library. That mouthful. Uh, and to my right, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I'm Rachel Mead. I'm the Public Engagement and Interpretation Coordinator at the Map Center. And Rachel, of course, is not really to my right. We are both in our in our own houses as we continue our remote programming. But we're really excited to begin uh, doing some visits to the branch libraries again to talk about how to think about maps and history and uh, local stories using some of our really cool remote tools. Uh, we before we get started, we have two uh, two fun guests um, to say hello to the audience. So I'm going to. Uh, wave goodbye very briefly to Rachel and bring on in her place Representative Adrian Madaro, uh, the state representative for East Boston. Hi, Adrian. Hey, Garrett. Thank you so much for having me. And thanks to you and Rachel for hosting this exciting event tonight. It's great to have you here. Uh, uh, Representative Madara is a friend of the MAP Center. Uh, we were going to have him uh, with us in person when we had originally planned this event way back uh, in the spring. Of course, our schedule was flummoxed by the pandemic. Um, so we're really thrilled that he could join us virtually. Uh, and we thought we'd invite him to just say a few things about uh, the community and the importance of thinking about maps and history uh, in terms of understanding East Boston today. Definitely. Thank you so much again, Garrett. And uh, I'm really excited to be here tonight. I've always been a fan of the Leventhal Center. I'm a, I'm a lover of history, a lover of maps. My house is covered in maps. Uh, but this particular tool that you will be exploring tonight is so cool. I had the opportunity to go online today uh, and just play around a little bit with it. It's something you could honestly get lost in for hours. And I encourage you all to have fun with it. Um, but again, thank you so very much for having me. Uh, I'm Adrian Madro, once again, the state representative for East Boston. Um, and I just I wanted to offer a few remarks to kind of set the stage and provide some context. I think we can all agree, right, that studying the history of our geography has enormous benefits. Geography helps us understand the history of our communities and our climate, and that really helps us prepare for the future. And when you're thinking about East Boston, it's particularly important in our discussions about climate change because Eastie has already been significantly impacted. And without strong and swift action, this is only gonna get worse. And you'll see this from the maps, but we are a coastal community, which makes us extremely vulnerable to sea level rise. And when we think about this, it helps to know that our neighborhood was actually created by connecting five different islands, Noddles, Apple, Governors, Bird, and Hog Islands with landfill. And in fact, much of our airport uh, and infrastructure was built on marshland in the harbor. The fact that so much of our community is built on this landfill also makes us really susceptible to groundwater levels rising. When you see current maps of East Boston, you'll see airports, highways, gas tanks. These were not always part of our neighborhood. And by studying the natural environment and the history of our geography, we can make better predictions about the future of our community and frankly, of our planet. And the more informed our predictions are, the better our environmental policies can be 
which really helps me in the work I do every day as the state representative for East Boston, fighting for policies to protect our community from environmental burdens and environmental injustice. The maps of our past also reveal important ways that East Boston developed as a neighborhood, how its physical space has changed, how the many waves of immigrants arriving here shaped our expansion and evolution, and our geography as a waterfront community really helped shape our rich maritime history. Some interesting facts, in the 19th century, our neighborhood was home to many of the nation's most prominent shipbuilders, including Donald McKay, who built some of the world's finest clipper ships, merchant boats really designed for speed. They were the fastest and largest sailboats to sail the seas, built right here on East Boston, the most famous of which was the Flying Cloud. In Eastie, we attracted every wave of immigration in this country. Uh, every successive wave of immigrant came through East Boston, and we processed more immigrants through our community than anywhere else in this nation, second only to Ellis Island in New York. So over the decades, East Boston really has been a launching pad for immigrants in search of a better life, including my own father, who came here some 35 years ago from Italy. And of course, none of this would have been possible if we weren't situated by the water. So as you look through the maps over time, you will see how the names on the different plots of land change with the different waves of immigration. So too change the many businesses and buildings in the neighborhood, the rise, shift, and decline of shipbuilding and other maritime businesses on the waterfront, the businesses that popped up or closed as our community changed, buildings that were in one spot at one point in time that are no longer there. Uh, an interesting thing is houses of worship. At one time, we were a predomin predominantly Protestant community, which then gave way to Catholicism with the rise of Irish and Italian immigrants. And in earlier years before that, we had at least five synagogues in East Boston serving what may have been the largest Jewish community in New England. As that population shifted out of our community today, only the cemetery remains uh, of that community. And it's actually the oldest Jewish cemetery in New England. At a separate site, there, there's a cemetery on Bennington Street that tells the same story. And it's quite notable for the many different languages that are inscribed from the different pockets of immigrants moving into our neighborhood. So our geography, of course, has evolved over the course of history and helped shape many aspects of our lives, including our work and in the community we live in. You can see uh, through the historical maps how the neighborhood grow, grew, how the community started as farmland early on and shifted to become a neighborhood, starting at the waterfront and slowly moving inland, um, empty plots of land filling up, getting more dense with that shift from small worker cottages to triple deckers, that includes the development of Orion Heights. It's really interesting to see these old maps, uh, the now forgotten planned streets for areas that are now McClellan Highway or Belle Isle Marsh or Suffolk Downs. And to compare and contrast what the map makers in the 1920s planned for the area to what is actually there now. And of course, the areas of the community we've lost to the highway uh, and especially to the, the development of Logan Airport. This includes the destruction of Wood Island Park, the Frederick Law Olmsted Park, and the demolition of residential streets as the airport expanded, the most notable being Neptune Road. In these maps, we rarely see the progress of East Boston's physical and social history, how we shaped the terrain, how it affected our industry and population for immigration, and how growth from those waves of immigrants changed our community. And just a couple fun facts to close out. Uh, again, I told you I'm a lover of history. The first railroad to the mainland from East Boston was completed in 1875. Before that, the only access East Boston residents had to the rest of the city and to downtown was via ferry. And what's now the Blue Line Tunnel actually became the first underwater subway tunnel in North America. We, uh, we are in, uh, in the space of the Boston Public Library, so I'd be remiss not to add that we had the first public library branch in the country right here in East Boston. And then as an Eagle Hill resident, which is a neighborhood of East Boston, one of my favorite factoids, is that East Boston was home to the first naval battle of the Revolutionary War, the Battle of Chelsea Creek, right at the base of Eagle Hill. So there is a lot of wonderful history in East Boston. Um, and I encourage you to learn that history, whether it's reading about it or, of course, looking at it through the maps, which is really an amazing way to convey East Boston's story. And I'm grateful that you're hosting this event tonight. And uh, thank you so much for allowing me to say a few words. Thanks so much. What a what a great introduction to the importance of these materials. And you know, like you said, uh, the reason we care so much about these is not just because they're kind of fun trip down memory lane, but because they help us understand the city we live in today. Uh, we always talk about how the city that we occupy and our homes and our businesses and our ways of life was built in the past, 
And a lot of those decisions are still have consequences um, on the present day. You really frame that, that, that quite beautifully. So really appreciate having you here. Thank you so um, much. Uh, well, uh, Representative Madara will be, I think, on the uh, our, on the line for a little bit, though he has to run uh, midway through. Uh, if you're just joining us on Facebook or YouTube, you can use the chat function or the comment function, and we should all see your comments. Then we will have an open Q&A at the end of the session. So thanks, Adrian. Uh, we'll, see you, uh, we'll see you backstage. And uh, I want to invite our second guest of the day, your wonderful East Boston branch librarian, Margaret Kelly. Hi, Margaret. Hi, Garrett. Thank you so much for coming and doing this presentation. Um, you know, it's great that you and Rachel are able to do it. Uh, we were very disappointed when our original lecture um, that you were coming to present got canceled. So uh, we're so happy to have you. And it's a perfect time to have it this week because it's Easty Week. So what better than to explore East Boston through history and maps? Um, so I know it's gonna be a great presentation. Uh, I wanna welcome everybody who is watching. And um, just remind you that Boston Public Library, the East Boston branch and all the other branches, while we are closed for in-service, um, people are able to order books and to pick them up in the afternoon. They can call for reference questions and um, we miss everybody and we can't wait to get back to you all um, and have you come and visit us. But um, we are looking forward to the presentation tonight and thank you so much once again for doing this. Yeah, and thank you for hosting us. We're so sad that we are not in your beautiful, beautiful branch library building. Uh, we're so looking forward to being there, uh, but we will be again sometime. Uh, and it, there couldn't be a better, uh, more perfect branch for us to pick back up where we left off. We had a whole series of uh, these sorts of events planned uh, before pandemic. And um, we are now, this is our first, uh, now that we've pivoted the, the series to a, a digital series, uh, we're picking back up in East Boston and we're really thrilled to be here. And of course, though, uh, myself and the rest of the MAP Center staff are always happy to answer questions about maps or cartography. Your branch librarians are amazing resources for local history, uh, for help with these materials and many others. Um, you know, even when we're closed, uh, librarians can help you find a world of information and yes. resources. Absolutely. Great. Great. Well, uh, Margaret will be on the line too, uh, in case you have any questions for her, but uh, we'll see you backstage, Margaret. And yep. I'm going to bring up my MAP Center colleague, Rachel Mead who is our public engagement and interpretation coordinator and is gonna be with me today talking about Atlas Scope and how we can use it to discover the history of East Boston. So I wanna say up front, neither Rachel nor I are historians of East Boston. We've used Atlas Scope to do a ton of fun research and digging into the historical geography of this neighborhood. Um, but what we're really gonna show you is how to do that, how to think about the past geographically through maps, how to use Atlascope as a tool to unpack and discover new kinds of questions uh, and use it as a kind of starting point to uh, uncover photographs and documents and text and other sorts of resources that aren't limited to the maps themselves. In the talk tonight, I'm gonna to start off just by saying a few things about Atlascope generally and how we made it at the Map Center and what sorts of materials are in it. Uh, and then Rachel's going to give you a kind of barnstorming tour through the uh, some of the coolest and most fun sites in East Boston that we can find on Atlascope. And then we're going to have a sort of open session at the end where we'll look at the places you all are interested in. Uh, again, you can use the comments tool to, to talk back to us uh, and we'll be listening for where we should all together take a look at the map. I'll also say this is the first time we're doing this virtually. Uh, in the past, we used to have two people, two computers, and a projector. Uh, now, Rachel will have to sort of figure out who's uh, who's presenting what at any given time. Um, but so, bear with us as we uh, kind of get the technical stuff uh, in gear, uh, and hopefully, it will be as legible as possible to you all. So, let's bring on our slideshow tonight. Do 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 do. Um, just a second. Okay. All right. Slide show. Whoops, let's bring it to the first slide. Sorry about that. 
Spoiler alert, we are going to thank you for coming. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, in case you were wondering, the last slide thanks you for coming. Um, if that's what you were waiting for the whole time, you can, uh, you can jump to the end right now. Uh, da -da -da -dum. So, okay, sorry, I had this playing by itself. All right, we're gonna start by talking about what is in the Atlascope collection. It looks like my screen is kind of half frozen up here. So let's bring this up here and do it this way instead. Da -da -da. Okay. Is that looking strange to everybody else? Because it looks strange yeah, to me. Yeah, it's very me, strange to me. Let me see why my screen is not wanting to show the slideshow. Let's try this. Let's try this. Da, 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 da. Apologies for the, oh, you're still seeing East Atlas. It looks like the slideshow is in the background. Yeah, why would that be? Let's, let's try it again. Sorry, sorry, <laughs> sorry. Like I said, we used to have two computers to do this, and now we have uh, one that is also giving. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. I'm going to start sharing my screen again, and we will try it one more time. Sorry about that. This is a classic live event problem that probably yes. would have happened in person as well. So <laughs> exactly. that's a little, a little taste of what life used to be like. Exactly. OK. I think it could be that my, my screen is just too big to broadcast. There we go. What are urban atlases? I've had you sitting on the edge of your seat wondering about this question. Uh, and now having built up the suspense, we can finally answer it. So Atlas Scope, oh, are we doing the same thing here? Let's, let's try something a little bit different. Uh, 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 um, I'm sorry. I think that my screen is perhaps too big to share. So we're going to try this instead which will just mean that I need to switch it when we actually go to Atlascope itself, but that's all right. Um, okay, I know you're like, our urban atlases, just tell me, spit out already. So we have a really amazing collection of atlases in the Leventhal Map Center. Uh, we, of course, are located at the Copley Main Library uh, downtown. Um, and these atlases cover not only Boston, uh, but many of its inner suburbs and cities and towns across Massachusetts. They're these large, bulky volumes. They're some of our most popular requested items. And the reason that they're so popular is that these atlases have a level of detail that's on few of our other maps. The reason that they have so much detail is because these atlases were produced for two reasons. One is these were used in the real estate industry uh, in the 19th and early 20th centuries. Um, you didn't pop up a GIS tax map or go on to Zillow uh, to look up a piece of property, of course, at that time. You needed a big bulky atlas to figure out who owned a parcel and um, perhaps whether uh, you were interested in buying it. But actually the more important reason that uh, many of these atlases was created is something we don't think about very much today. They were actually used to rate fire insurance. Um, so if you were a fire insurer, you wanted to know a lot of things about neighborhoods down to a very detailed level. You wanted to know whether buildings were likely to burn. You would wanted to know were they near other buildings that might be likely to burn. You'd want to know things about where there were, um, where there was water supply lines, um, whether there were uh, guards or um, fire watchmen nearby. <clears throat> and so this is an example of a legend plate from uh, one of those atlases. We sometimes call them Sanborns. The Sanborn Company was the most famous publisher of these atlases, uh, though actually only a, a small number of, the, of our atlases were, were produced by the Sanborn Company itself. Uh, but you can see that the legend includes all sorts of information about the construction of the building, how many stories, how many exits, um, who owned it. And that allows us this really amazing window into the past. Um, we have information about buildings, about their owners, about their construction, about their design, um, right down to the level where you can sometimes see like a fountain in a courtyard or the shape of a bay window um, in the 19th century. So as I said, these are really popular items to visit in the library, but they're clumsy, they're, so they're they're big. Uh, we will happily pull them for you and show them to you when we're open. Uh, but uh, 
it takes some time and you have to figure out which one you're interested in. So each one of these volumes covers a different area. Some cover downtown, some cover East Boston, some cover East Boston and Charlestown, some cover, um, you know, Chelsea and Everett, but each, uh, it's very idiosyncratic, which, which ones cover which areas and at which times. So comparing a single spot, um, if you're interested in one piece of property across many different years, um, is really hard to do with the, paper physical atlases. So what we did is we digitally transformed 101 of these atlases. Again, they're big. Each atlas um, might have 50, 60, or 70 pages in it. Um, <coughs> so this took an enormous amount of work. Um, uh, Rachel was one of, uh, one of the <laughs> staff members who did a ton and ton of this digital transformation of these materials. And they cover a period from about 1860 to the late 1930s, which is important to recognize we have tons of other maps in the map center going back to the 15th century and up to the present day. But this particular type of map, these fire insurance and real estate atlases, the most important stretch of years that they cover is roughly from the Civil War to the Second World War. So if something not on Atlas scope during that time, it doesn't mean we don't have it in the map center collections, it just means uh, this type of material, this type of atlas um, may not exist um, for years before or after this period. <clears throat> so uh, what Alloscope allows us to do is on the left here, you can see this is our digital collections um, portal where you would have had to look one page at a time for the thing you were looking for. So here's an atlas of Suffolk County. If you were looking for a particular place in Boston, you might have had to page through hundreds and hundreds of individual map plates to find the specific area you were interested in. In the lower right here, you can see Atlascope, where we've combined all of those map plates into a single layer. And it looks kind of like what you expect from a modern map, right? Like if you're on Google Maps or Apple Maps, it just drops it right down on top of where the thing really is. So this took a lot of work. Um, it took a lot of technical uh, labor and programming design. But now what we have is this Atlascope tool where you can kind of jump to any place and find all of the atlas layers that we have across time for that place. <coughs> Excuse me again. Um, so again, we, we did about 100 atlases, but remember they each cover a different area. Um, so different areas have different coverage. In East Boston, there's about 10 atlases, um, which cover most of East Boston, ranging from about 1868 to 1922. Of course, as you get um, towards Charlestown, or if you cross jump uh, over the harbor into the city, you're going to get different coverage. So downtown has the best coverage. There's about 18 atlases that cover the area downtown. So Atlas Scope is available. It's free. You don't have to subscribe or pay or log in uh, like all of our work. It's free to the public. Um, and you can visit it on atlasscope.leventhalmap.org. Um, one of the cool things about it is you can also do this on your phone. We designed Atlascope to work really well on your phone. So remember, if you're like out walking around and you see a building and you're like, huh, I wonder where that building was built. It's a perfect place to use Atlascope. Bring it up on your phone. You can jump right to where you're standing and learn more about the past. <clears throat> and we encourage you to uh, browse along with us. Uh, and, and follow along to the sites that we're visiting remotely all together. Excuse me. So how does Atlas Scope work? This is just a really simple tutorial. Uh, we built it to be very user-friendly. Um, so hopefully most of how Atlas Scope works is self-evident. But when you bring the main Atlas Scope page up, you'll see this starting spot. And for most of today's uh, kind of lessons or examples, we're going to use this middle button, which is to search places. We're going to find an address, and we're going to go to that address. If you click that search places button, you get this. It looks like um, what you probably expect, an address lookup field. And here we've entered 37 Meridian Street. Uh, that's the address at the branch library. And you can see in the drop down menu, there's some suggestions. Uh, looks like there's also a 37 Meridian in Malden. Um, but we want the East Boston one. So if we click that East Boston one, that second red arrow, now we've jumped to 37 Meridian Street. And these, uh, at the bottom, you'll see the main kind of control interface for Atlas Scope. On the left, we're choosing what our the kind of bottom map is. So it's a modern map. You can see uh, there's Route 1A, 
Um, you can see uh, things like uh, restaurants and uh, buildings that are here today. That's like a modern, what you would pull up on your phone. And then on the right, you can see that the overlay map is right now showing 1868. So that that kind of portal down the uh, in the middle of the screen, we're looking, th the, you can imagine looking through the modern map into 1868 to exactly where the buildings were uh, matched up. If we click that 1868, we'll pop up a little menu. So here's all of the years that are available for this specific spot on Meridian Street. You can see from 1868 to 1922, we have 10 different atlases. And so we could really walk through time. We could start in 1868, switch to 1870, 74, and walk all the way through to 1922, seeing the changes as we go along. Now remember, uh, uh, just a reminder that uh, this menu will change depending where you were. So if we were looking at a place in downtown, this menu would be really long because there's uh, whatever, two dozen atlases that cover that area. Whereas if you were in, um, let's say Winthrop, uh, I think we only have one or maybe two uh, atlases that cover Winthrop. So this menu, menu would be shorter. And of course, we've only digitized atlases for Boston and inner suburbs. So if you were to jump to Worcester, unfortunately, you would not see anything uh, because we don't have any Worcester atlases yet. Though I will say it is in the works. We're trying to bring a lot more material across the state into Atlas Scope. So here I've jumped to 1912 and you can see that was 1868, 1912, buildings have changed. Uh, you can see buildings go up, you can see buildings come down, you can see streets get built, you can see land get filled in. Um, you can see the owners and the occupants and businesses change over time. And that's really one of the things that is amazing about Atlas Cove that's very difficult to do with the paper maps is you can just kind of page through time looking at these changes uh, as they flip by on the maps. So this little spyglass is, is our favorite way of, of uh, kind of controlling the map, but there are other ways to look at it too. Um, so in the middle there, you can see you could swipe left to right or up and down, or you could do opacity. Um, so what this opacity does is now the, the historic map is kind of fully uh, on top of the modern map. And if we, we drag this from 100 to zero, we'd fade back and forth in between the modern map and the contemporary and the historic map. And you kind of see switching from one to the other, um, like a fade transition. As you can see on the left, there's still that search places. So if we want to jump to another address, we can search there. And if you're on your phone and you're out uh, in the wild, if you click that find me button and you give Atlas Go permission to use your phone's location, you'll jump right to the spot that you're, you are. So again, this is a great kind of like field study thing. If you're standing in front of a building, open up Atlas Go, click Find Me, jump into the past and see what was going on there in 1912 or 1868. <coughs> so what we're going to do now is Rachel's going to take you on a little tour of Atlas Go in East Boston. And we're going to show you um, this isn't meant to be an authoritative everything that ever happened in East Boston or even the most important things that happened in East Boston. It's really a way of thinking about the past geographically and thinking about how what we see on these Atlas scope maps can open up other questions about um, geographic relationships, about environmental transformations, about shape, sh shifting forms of the city, who lived where, who was doing what at different times. Um, and also how you can use Atlas Scope to discover some of the other objects in the PPL's historic collections and in other places as well. So I'm going to hand it over to Rachel. Uh, we're going to do our best for, I'm going to keep handling the slides and Atlas Scope in the background. Um, and then after Rachel gives her, her tour, uh, we're going to open up to questions and we can kind of explore Atlas Scope together as a big uh, digital crowd. So Rachel, over to you. Great. Yeah, so I will say there's definitely not a lot of, a lot, not as much breadth as um, someone may have wanted in this uh, this tour because I did um, experience what I think many of you will experience when you use Atlas Scope, which is I got really into some really specific things. Um, so uh, hopefully you like those things too. Um, I did see a question in the um, comments um, from YouTube. There are atlases that reach Revere. I don't think we have any in Atlas Scope that go to Lynn yet, um, but hopefully someday we will. Yes. Uh, because the atlases exist, they're just not in Atlas Scope. 
And you'll get a very friendly note if you try to jump to somewhere we don't have atlases saying, sorry, we don't have any atlases here yet. Uh, but we are working on, uh, together with some partners, um, bringing in many more hundreds of atlases into the collection that cover both more years in Boston in its, uh, in its suburbs, as well as all throughout Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. So this is just um, the extent of East Boston in 1912, as far as the um, map makers were concerned. Um, so like the representative said, so much of Boston is built on filled land um, and especially East Boston. So you can see the entire area where the airport is supposed to be um, didn't exist in 1912. Um, so this is just like an overview. Um, you can see this for any of the years that we have. So I think uh, there's like 10 different years that you can look at um, just to see kind of the outer bounds of, um, of East Boston on Atlascope. The, um, the next slide here is what the first thing that I came to when I was just kind of playing along, um, looking at different parts of the city in Atlascope. So right here, there's the grain elevator um, you can see on the right. This is um, something that I was very curious about. So I went to Digital Commonwealth, um, which if you've never used it before, is a really great resource, um, digitalcommonwealth.org. It is um, like a compendium of all of the digital collections from libraries and museums and archives around the state. And one of the things that I found um, is this beautiful uh, photo of East Boston from the top of the grain elevator, circa 1930. So, and this uh, is a great. The as Rachel said, uh, the our atlases are also in digital Commonwealth, not transform mm -hmm. the way that they are in Atlascope. But um, it's a great place to to kind of expand a, a discovery, right? So, like. You know, having found the grain elevator, then jumping over to Digital Commonwealth and searching for a grain elevator in East Boston and finding an image like this is a super example of how something on the map triggers a kind of like a research discovery and finding things that one might not have found uh, originally. Yeah, yeah. So, so one of the things that I probably wouldn't have found um, if I hadn't been using Digital Commonwealth is this amazing pamphlet called Facts Concerning East Boston, um, which is, first of all, very beautiful. Um, but it's also this like 20th century um, pamphlet published by the East Boston Company who are trying to get people to move to East Boston. So if we go to the, the next slide, which is the, um, the first page of this pamphlet, it talks about how it's an ideal location for homes. Um, it's uh, healthful and inexpensive, and it's um, kind of geared towards um, middle class families, um, self-defined. Uh, to kind of come to East Boston and, and raise their families there. Um, so a bunch of the things that I'll show you are from that. Um, but I wanted to start off kind of with some library history of East Boston. So the um, original East Boston branch of the BPL was in the second Lyman School. Um, so you can see Lyman School here on the map. Um, this was actually not the first a uh, school built on that location is the second. I believe the first one burned down. There is still a Lyman school in East Boston, but it's on a slightly different location. So after, um, after the school moved, the building was taken over and turned into the East Boston Public Library. Um, it was there from 1869 to 1914. So pretty good run. Um, it was also a courthouse, a police station, and a high school over the years. So if we go to the next slide, um, you can see that some of those years, it was actually more than one thing at once. Uh, at this time, um, it was in the early 20th century, it was both the courthouse and the um, Boston Public Library. And if you look at this image, which is from that pamphlet that I showed you before, um, it actually says like Boston Public Library, East Boston Branch um, on the building. So that's the same building that's on the map. Um, you can kind of see how the shape fits, which I thought was really cool. Yeah. One thing I should have said earlier is, you know, there's obviously there are tons of text on this map, the, all of these maps, right? So even this mm -hmm. one, we see courthouse and it's the branch of the public library. I can't quite read. What is that uh, up in the corner? I think there? It's um, unfinished. Unfinished. So there's like, it's telling you even about, you know, the wing of the building is unfinished. 
one thing that people ask us all the time is, can I search for that text, the historic text on the maps? And unfortunately, we can't do that yet. So like when you search an address, you're searching today's addresses because those are the addresses that we have digital information for. Um, if you were to search, uh, you know, courthouse, you'd get today's courthouse, not the text courthouse from this historic map. But we are working on ways of pulling text out of these maps so that you can search names and places from the historic objects as well. Which will be really fun. Yeah. <laughs> So then um, the Boston Public Library moved in 1914 um, to 282 Meridian Street. Um, the uh, picture of the library here um, is, is actually that building still exists. Um, you can see it on the next slide. And what's really interesting, Garrett, I'm really glad that you brought that up because it's perfect um, for this example. On the map, it says 282 Meridian Street um, for the public library. But today, in today's addresses, it's at 276 Meridian Street. So this is a Google Street Map view that I uh, screen capped today. Um, sometimes these addresses change over time. So you can't rely on knowing an address, knowing where something is today to know where it was back then. It could be in the exact same location, but have a totally different address. Um, so that's always something to be careful of. Um, and just know that you need to like pan around a little bit um, in case it's not actually at the right address. So always like look at the address on Atlascope and see if you're in the place that you thought you would be. And sometimes that means you have to zoom way in. Um, you know, Atlascope, as well as all of our historic collections are really, um, the images are amazing. You can zoom in so closely that sometimes you can see the tears on the maps and the, you know, like pencil marks and things like that. Um, so to see some of these small pieces of text, uh, like 282, uh, you need to zoom way in. I actually saw somebody asked about how to zoom in on the maps. Um, if you're on a computer, you can use your scroll wheel or your, um, like, uh, double finger scroll to zoom in or out. Um, or if you're on a phone or a tablet, you can pinch and zoom just like you would on Google Maps or another phone map. Mm -hmm. This is a, a picture from inside that branch of the um, East Boston Public Library. This is from 1939. Um, the, this is an image from the adults room. So people reading quietly. Um, the, this branch, was open until 2013. So the, the Bremen Street um, branch was opened, I think in 2013 um, to replace this one. Um, there was actually also a Jeffries Point branch of the Boston Public Library, which I didn't know before. Um, so it was originally just on the ground floor of this wooden building facing Belmont Square or Belmont Park. Um, here's another example where Atlascope um, doesn't give you all the information you need because if you look just at the map here at 195 um, Webster Street, um, it doesn't say that there's the Boston Public Library there. Um, the way that you have to find things is sometimes a little bit convoluted. Um, and often the, the only information that you can find, especially on the real estate houses, is who owned the building. Um, so that can be really frustrating, especially if you're trying to find histories of people who rented. Um, which is probably most people in Boston's history, definitely most of the people who aren't super wealthy. Um, so especially doing like our own family genealogies, sometimes you have to be a little bit creative with how you're looking at stuff. Um, often census information is really valuable um, and you can use that in conjunction with Atlascope to find out where your family lived. And this is a very exciting looking event from inside that that branch of the public library, um, which then moved down Webster Street. So if we go to the next slide, it moved into this brick duplex. Um, on the Alice, it says that the school is taking this building, but it turned out that the library took the building. Um, so I think they knew that, that the city was taking control of it. They didn't know exactly for what. Um, it became the library and it's a private residence today. 
And I should note that um, this image and the last image are both from um, Anthony Samarco's East Boston history book. Um, he's written a bunch for a bunch of different neighborhoods of Boston and they're really great, um, especially as reference for like photographs and stuff like that. This note with the school taking too is a, is a, a good place to stop and note that because these atlases were so expensive and laborious to produce, um, that oftentimes, uh, especially in the later years, in the 20th century, rather than print a whole new copy of the atlas each year, uh, the atlas makers, the publishers would uh, send out corrections. Um, sometimes those were corrected uh, just by, in pen, as you can see here, somebody has used a marker and, paint, and penned over this building. Um, but some of them, they, the publishers would actually send what were called paste-ons. So they'd send them uh, like a little piece of paper that you would paste over a, like a block or a, you know, a section of a block with the new information uh, because that was much more, uh, it was much cheaper than, you know, printing up an entire new volume of the, these atlases. Again, these atlases were really difficult to produce. Um, these were like, you know, this kind of super, super computers, hot, cutting edge technology of their time. Um, you didn't just like buy one of these if you were an ordinary person. These were held by libraries and again by insurers and, and uh, real estate interests. So um, in the, the facts concerning East Boston pamphlet that I brought up earlier, there's this great section about the um, public gymnasium uh, maintained by the city of Boston, um, which has been of incalculable benefit to the boys and girls of the district. Um, in both a physical and moral way. Um, so that's really great news um, for the boys and girls of the neighborhood. Um, and it also mentions that, um, that it's centrally located. So you learn a lot about the neighborhoods based on these objects that you find. Um, so you know that this right here, this uh, map in the center that I put here, um, is a central location um, in, in East Boston at the time for the, the particular neighborhood that it's in. So here's a cute picture of some, some kids using the gym and it's actually today um, still um, a community center. It's the Paris Street Community Center, um, which is a BCYF location. So you can still go there if you live <laughs> in East Boston. Um, this is the shoreline in 1912. Um, so as um, Representative Madero said, um, there are these uh, areas of Boston that are filled in, especially right here, um, which is the airport um, area. You can really see on this map in particular, the shoreline um, and how close it is to where all the buildings are, first of all. But second of all, that they're planning out and plotting out these streets that don't exist yet. So um, on the next slide, there's this really interesting thing where I zoomed in and you can see um, that what's actually there at the time is a footbridge. <laughs> so there's a bridge over the water at the time. And then the East Boston Company, um, which produced that pamphlet that we've been looking through, uh, owns all of the land that's going to be created there. Um, these are a couple of images from, again, from Digital Commonwealth, and this one's from Historic New England, whose collections are available through Digital Commonwealth. Um, a picture of the tennis courts and gymnasium, and then this aerial photograph from 1925, which is um, right after the airport is built. So you can see some of the land is filled in already, um, but Wood Island Park is still there. Um, which it, it ends up being completely uh, taken over by the airport. So this is from 1922, this atlas. The, uh, as Garrett said, you can kind of play with atlas scope. You can have it in the little spyglass mode, or you can slide it from left to right or up and down. And here I thought that this was a really, really good image of um, so where someone has written in airport taking. Um, or taking for airport purposes. And on the other side, you can see the modern um, aerial photo of what the airport looks like. Um, so the airport opened in 1923, and originally it was just um, kind of a private airport. Um, it wasn't for passenger planes. We go to the next slide, there's some great photos. So there's this woman named Ruth Elder, um, who was an aviator in Boston at the time. This picture's from March, 1928. 
And then on the right side here is the christening of the first passenger plane a year later in, Mar in April 1929. There's a lot of great, um, there's a lot of great airport imagery in digital Commonwealth. Um, something that I thought was really great, kind of sticking with our transportation theme, is um, these houses that got completely moved um, in the early 20th century. Um, this one got moved from 408 Frankfurt to 2 Milton um, to make room for Wood Island Station. So if we go onto the next slide. There's this really great explanation for why um, why it can be so confusing to find addresses today. Um, back in the day, this street was Milton Street and then Horace Street and then Milton Street. Um, today, it's just Horace Street. So the um, the addresses have really changed over the years. It's really hard to figure out which house that one that we saw on the on the lift is. There's another one on the next slide that I think is really great um, of the house moving. And you can see right there where Wood Island Station is today and how there used to be a, a residential street going right through. So this house is actually um, 426 Frankfurt, um, which would have been right between the two that you can see numbered there, 428 and 424. This was just a little thing that I found of the East Boston Ferry. Um, there's a really cute little ticket. Um, from 1844. Um, it seems like it kind of worked the way Charlie cards do today where you could put time on it um, instead of money. So I think this is a three month uh, like ferry ticket. Um, and then obviously the ferry kept running. There's still um, ferries today that are part of the MBTA. But in 1904, um, this tunnel was built, the East Boston Tunnel, between um, Long Wharf, basically, and East Boston. So you can see here um, where the tunnel like goes under um, Long Wharf at Atlantic Street, and then where it comes back up at Maverick. Um, this is the same tunnel that they use for the Blue Line today, I believe. Um, and so it's been open for 116 years. It's the first North American subway tunnel under a body of water. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the, the ways that, you know, kind of seeing the historical city today, so much of Boston's infrastructure was built during the exact period of time that was that's covered by these atlases, subways, uh, rail lines, roads. And so you can see how the decisions about where, you know, where would somebody have put a subway, a tunnel in, um, in the early 20th century, you know, you can really see those decisions being played out on these maps. And of course, we're still riding the blue line in the same subway tunnel today, um, you know, and it's shaping patterns of mobility and, and where things are getting built and, and where uh, the community is changing. Yeah. Yeah, so this is, these are some great images of the, the tunnel um, from kind of left to right-ish. We have um, some people digging the tunnel, uh, which is a, an illustration. We have an image of the tunnel from the Atlantic Street entrance um, in the middle. In the upper right, there's the tunnel from Maverick. And below that, there are some uh, laborers who've been building the actual tracks, um, kind of pausing to, to have a picture taken of them. Um, we talked a little bit about immigration in the introduction. Um, East Boston is a neighborhood of immigrants and it has been for a very long time. Uh, one of the ways that immigrants uh, arrived in Boston was by steamship. So the Cunard lines um, came from Liverpool through Halifax to Boston. Uh, and so a lot of European immigrants came through uh, the East Boston line. And actually um, the Cunard line uh, had owned both of these piers at, at different points. So I'm not exactly sure which of these piers is the one that ends up um, having the images in the next slide, um, which are pictures of this um, immigration facility. So on the steamship lines pier, when people arrived in the country, they would go through um, basically customs um, at, on the pier. And then people who didn't have someone to come pick them up would actually be sent to the immigrants' home on the next slide um, until 
something could be done with them. So the immigrant's home was there starting at least in 1901. That's the first time it appears on one of our atlases. Um, the building that we see here in the pictures was built in 1912. Um, the building was actually remodeled in 1972-73 um, to turn it into elder housing and office space, I believe. So actually, even though it looks like the building is still there, only the facade is the same. Um, but you can still see that it says immigrants home um, and that it was erected in 1912. And it's a great point too, to uh, think about how we use Atlascope to date buildings, right? So not every building uh, has good building records that you know say this building was built on so-and-so date, uh, especially for residential buildings. Sometimes it's just a guess. And Atlascope can be a great way to test that out, right? So we don't have maps for every single year, but in some places we have maps uh, nearly every year or every decade at least. Mm -hmm. um, so we can, you can look to see, okay, my house or this building that I'm interested in, it does appear on the map this year, but it doesn't appear on the map that year. So I know it was built sometime during that, that period. Um, and that yeah. can help us to date buildings, um, at least to the decade, if not to the exact year. And you can use um, like context clues from the the uh, like the key that we looked at earlier, the legend. Um, I knew when I looked at the 1901 map that it wasn't the same building because the the 1901 map um, the building is yellow, which means that it's frame, um, and we know that by 1922 the building is brick. Mm -hmm. So um, there's a lot of there's a lot of like little pieces of the puzzle that you can put together using Atlascope. And then um, one really important part of the immigration story in East Boston is this um, immigration station, which was on a pier uh, a couple, you know, a few hundred yards over from the Cunard Pier. Um, this was uh, replacing a facility that was on Long Wharf from 1904 to 1920, and it opened, I think, in 1920. Um, so many of the immigrants who came to Boston were processed through this station. Um, and it was honestly a pretty terrible place. Um, there are records from even when it first opened of it having inadequate heating, um, a leaky roof. They did a really bad job uh, building it in general and planning it because it was originally supposed to be a five-story building. Um, it got negotiated down to three and then it ended up being a one-story building. Um, you can see it kind of extending out over the water here. In, in a kind of precipitous way. Um, there were often huge crowds outside of it, apparently, um, trying to communicate with people inside the facility. Um, so there was often like a very heavily guarded presence. Um, it was used for immigrants up through the end of World War II. There's records of a few um, Holocaust survivors who arrived as stowaways. Um, on a ship that I think was from Liverpool. Um, and they were sent to this facility in 1946 um, to await whatever would happen to them. And I've been trying to follow up on that um, using other research channels and I, I haven't found anything yet, but I'll let you know when I do. So, um, and then here's just a really nice picture of Boston from East Boston. Um, if anyone has questions, I think we have some time for, for Q&A if you want to ask through the comments. We also can look up places in Atlascope with you if you want. Um, and please, uh, Garrett just put this banner at the bottom, give us feedback on our talk um, using that link. Uh, we would really like to know how you heard about this, if you liked it, what you liked about it and what you didn't, because um, we're going to be doing a lot of these community nights um, around Boston for the next few months. Um, and we'd love to know what you thought. Yeah, and I'm going to bring back um, uh, Margaret onto the screen. Uh, Margaret, you ready to, come, ready to come back and join us? Uh, and I'm going to I'm going to try losing my slideshow and uh, actually bringing up a little Atlascope window so that we can um, we can look up some places. Uh, so again, if you're on Facebook or YouTube, we should uh, see your comments right, right in here. 
Um, so if anybody has an address that they want to look up, uh, let us know and, uh, and we'll go look it up in real time. Uh, so let's see, I'm going to lose that screen um, share. And somebody asked, um, if the maps are available for download, they are, um, you can download them as GeoTIFFs. You can download them just as regular tips and geo reference them or geo transform them yourself. Um, they're in our collections. So if you if you go to digital collections um, on the Leventhal Map website, you'll be able to find them. Yeah, one of our biggest goals with Atlascope is, you know, uh, even though Atlascope is really easy to use, we still want you to be able to come in and see the collections um, in person. So from, from a certain view, you can always click about this map. You can get all of the library catalog information so that when we're open in person, uh, again, you can come down uh, to Copy Square and see it in person and also uh, download some of the geospatial information. Um, and of course, our librarians, uh, our team is always happy to help you find more information, uh, to access some of the more sophisticated geospatial resources behind Atlascope. Um, and uh, to do more exploring of the past through maps. So it looks like we have some suggestions. Uh, let's try. Uh, let's try in order. Let's. Can so we look at the, the first one? Is from is actually from someone at seven fourteen p.m. <laughs> seven fourteen. Let's um, scroll way back. <laughs> asked about Bennington Street between Byron and Moore. All right. Let's see Bennington Street between Byron and Moore. Bennington Street. Oops. So as you can see, I'm searching Bennington Street, East Boston, Mass. Um, uh, let's find Byron and more. I don't know East Boston well enough. Margaret, can you help me? Do I need to keep going in this direction? I cannot tell from here, sadly. Yeah. <laughs> Bennington Street isn't too long, so. Da, da, da. Where is Byron? Where is Moore? There's Moore Street, and there's Byron Street. Okay, so here we go. Here's Byron Street. Um, uh, Bennington Street's running right down the middle here, and here's more. Um, so the Star of the Sea Catholic Church, uh, interestingly reflecting something that the representative had had noted, uh, the prevalence of immigrants and Catholicism uh, coming into the area. Of course, uh, churches, synagogues, um, later mosques and other houses of worship are good uh, evidence of what kinds of ethnic communities are moving into a neighborhood at a given time. Um, so there's 1882. Let's let's jump all the way up to 1922. Looks like the Star of the Sea Catholic Church is still there. Uh, you can see it's owned by the um, Archbishop. St. Mary's School has gone in across from it, as well as a convent. Um, there's, a, there's a fire station here on the Byron Street side um, and a bunch of residential buildings in between, including a whole row of uh, residential buildings on the Bennington Street side. So uh, where, what else do we have? Let's see, let's see where are our comments. Do, 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 do. Uh, can we look at the petroleum pier on Chelsea Street? See how it developed over the years. Sure, let's try it out. Okay, the 400 block of Chelsea Street, 400 Chelsea Street, it's Boston. Okay, here's Chelsea Street, or at least the 400 block today. Da, 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 da. Let's look, I'm gonna change our modern layer to an aerial layer. Okay, so now we can actually see like a satellite view in the background to compare it to. Um, there's Chelsea Street, I hope I'm in the right place. Um, and you can see that it was uh, the freight rail and uh, rail sidings in 1882. Let's, let's actually go back all the way to 1874. Um, so you can see this was kind of the edge of, of developed East Boston. Here's a, um, just over here, Neptune, Orleans, Frankfort, Lubeck Street. That's oh. the head platted out. Margaret, did you have a, did you have an insight as a? As a <laughs> so, uh, no, in fact, I missed kind of what you just said. So Neptune mm -hmm. Street was taken over by the airport, I believe. We still have Neptune, or we have Neptune Road. Um, but no. Yeah, you can see this where Neptune Road here is, this is going out towards the airport. That's that's the airport. And actually here's, this, this is the petroleum pier, I think, um, or at least part of the petroleum depot. Um, so here we are walking through 
uh, you can see this area here. Here's now it has it, the the um, railroad cl classification yard has gotten bigger. Uh, this whole neighborhood to the southeast, which again that's on land that is now um, industrial, uh, going into the airport, has all been platted out um, for speculative development as well. And again, we're doing this all well, sort of in real time, seeing what we see on the map. I'm sure some of our watchers uh, know more about the history of East Boston and its local neighborhoods than we do. Uh, but it's just kind of a taste of what you can, you can kind of discover in real time. Uh, what's next? 175 Trenton Street. Please, certainly. Um, and this is great. We'll go to a specific address. 175 Trenton Street, East Boston. Okay, so we're gonna zoom all the way in here. Here's 175 Trenton Street. It's on this little triangle. I hope I'm in the right spot here. Uh, it looks like Mayo and Atwood uh, owned this as of 1874. Um, let's actually walk through every year on this little parcel. Um, so again, there's the present, here's the past, 1874. Let's go back. 1868, you can see uh, we're just off the edge of the map. Um, so 1868 is not going to help us. 1870, also still just off of the edge of the map. You can see the edge of our, of our historic map right there. So it looks like 1874 is the first time we see uh, this specific spot in Trenton Street. Let's go to 1882, still a vacant lot. 1884, looks like Mayo, Mayo, still... <coughs> still owns this land. 1885, look, a building has been built. Um, and we can actually see, looks like that's maybe the exact same building. Uh, looks possible. It's hard to tell, actually, the, the old map is better than the modern map, so it's hard to tell if there actually is a, a little rounded bay window there. 1892, uh, this Ida M. Chase owned it in 1892. You can see actually the address is there. So we're actually, it's been 175 Trenton Street since at least 1892. 1901, Ida Chase still owned it. 1912, <coughs> still Ida Chase. In 1922, George Chase. So, <coughs> excuse me, here's likely a, a case where Ida Chase uh, probably passed away. George M. Chase either son uh, or uh, widower. <coughs> um, so, you know, we can see the family succession within a single building like that. Uh, I'm just going to work through some of the comments here. <coughs> Seven Haynes Street. Let's try that. Seven Haynes Street, East Boston. Okay. Does that look right to us? <laughs> so we're right over on the edge here. Is this actually Haines Street? Again, I don't know East Boston, are we? Yeah, okay, so Haines Street in 1868 was actually called Center Street. Um, you can see there's Haines Street on the modern map. Here we are on the historic map and it's called Center Street. Um, interestingly, so there's an example of a street name changing. Um, I'm just gonna kind of randomly click through here. Uh, you can see there's a carriage, carriage house built here. <laughs> By 1885, iron storage uh, down at the corner uh, on Orleans. Yeah, you can also see some of the industrial facilities. Here's a lumber yard, uh, woodwork, machine shop, um, forges, tinware, oils, uh, an ironclad building. You can see this. The, here's railway tracks cutting right across the intersection. <laughs> so looks like some interesting stuff going on here. Let's jump to 22. Again, looks like these four brick buildings were still there. Um, those become Haines Street by by this point. Um, uh, and these uh, this these rail uh, expanded. We've got a heating and pumping station over here on the corner of Clyde Street. Warehouses again, part of the the, the East Boston shipyards. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm sorry, uh, everyone. I have a little tickle in my throat, and my teacup, uh, unfortunately, is empty. Uh, so <laughs> I can't, uh, I can't, I can't get a nice uh, cup of tea to, to see that down. Rachel, I, I'm happy to do some searching. Do you want to do some narration? Um, should we do the next one? Uh, sure. 
Let's see, how about 247 Webster Street? We have a question, let's try that one. 247 Webster. I saw that someone has asked if other cities have made use of Atlas Scope. We are hoping that they will. Uh, <laughs> there are, um, there are definitely fire insurance and real estate analysis of other cities, um, and we would love to help them develop Atlas Scope. So if you got a favorite city out there um, that has a library, that has a collection of uh, historic atlases, show them Atlas Scope. <laughs> yeah. And um, we sh I should say, we uh, so the city of Boston proper is on Atlas Scope. Uh, we also have Let's see if I can remember this. Newton, Brookline, Somerville, Cambridge, Chelsea, Revere, and Winthrop. I don't think I'm forgetting any, but I think that's possible. right. I think that I think those are all of the inner suburbs that are currently on Atlas Scope. Um, and then again, we're we're trying to expand it as as we speak. So, anyways, here's the. Oh, I I already have forgotten where we're looking at Webster Street here. Um, you can see this is a building, a brick building, all the way back to 18. 68 um looks like there was a shipsmith across the way a whole several shipsmiths there's a there's a cooper um you can see a cooper's building uh, right here a green building <coughs> um, so some interesting uh maritime related stuff oh actually i've seen this before these really beautifully outlined dry docks um so these are yeah. of course in the shape of ships um where ships would have been brought for repair into dry dock Oh, there's a really great picture that I did not pull for the uh, for the presentation of a boat that like just ran straight into a pier, <laughs> or into, I think it might have been into the front of a dry dock. And there's just like you see the ship, the nose of the ship, and then you see like this divot in the pier um, that is in the shape of the of the ship ship shape. Um, there's a lot of there's a lot of really good like disaster photography in digital Commonwealth. And one of the other things that we're working on, again, we'd love to get your feedback. Um, let me put that banner up again, da, 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 da. give us feedback. Uh, we'd like to give, get your feedback, not just on the talk, but on Atlas Scope in general. We're currently working on some new features in Atlas Scope, including the ability to bring up um, historic photos from digital Commonwealth directly from the map. Um, so we're working on our kind of Atlas Scope 2 revisions that um, will hopefully be out later this year. Um, but if uh, there are, you have ideas about how to improve Atlas Scope or if you want to find bugs, um, we'd, love to, uh, we'd love to hear about them so we can fix them. I want to say one other thing. Um, at the top right, you'll see this share button. Uh, you can share Atlas Scope generally, but also the second one, share this specific view. If you send this link to somebody, <coughs> they will open up exactly this view looking at this you know round window onto marginal street here by the dry dock so that that shares the, uh, that spot itself um, if you found a spot you're interested in and then finally there's a there's like an embed code right here the third one so if you have a website or a blog uh, or if you're a newspaper writer um, you can actually embed a live version of, of Atlas scope right into um, right into what you're working on. I think we are just about at the top of the hour. So I am going to just bring back up our final slide one more time so that you all have the URL once again. Do, 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 do. Margaret, let's bring you back. We lost you for a second, but here you are. Hi again, Margaret. Or maybe we've lost you again. The internet is a fickle thing. Um, We'd love to hear what you guys, uh, what everybody's finding on Atlas Scope. Um, so our reference librarians are always uh, uh, willing to help and to help you discover new things. If you find something that you think merits more research, again, we have we have maps in the collections that are much older than the Atlas Scope materials. Usually, they don't have the same level of details as the as the maps that are found here. Um, but we can help you track down other objects like that um, to help answer a research question. Um, and we're also just very curious to, to see what you find. There's, uh, there's more in Atlas Scope than anybody could uh, discover in one lifetime. <coughs> so um, it's fun for us to see what people uncover. Yeah, for sure. Um, cool, if well, you guys want to see this slideshow, there's the link here. Um, 
but also this video is going to be saved. Um, it'll still be on Facebook and YouTube tomorrow. Um, so if you wanna come back through it um, or get the link to the slideshow later, it'll be here. Um, the one thing is if you, if you do go to the link, um, you'll be able to click through to see all the views um, and all of the objects that I pulled from Digital Commonwealth. So I linked all of those. Yeah, thanks for tuning in, everyone. And as Rachel said earlier, uh, this is our first on a series of virtual whistle stops um, to some of our partner branch libraries. Um, so keep an eye on our website, leventhalmap.org, um, or Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram, where we are BPL Maps on all of those platforms. Um, and we'll be uh, hopefully soon announcing some of our dates in some other uh, local areas. Yep. So um, see you all later. The next one is uh, October 7th at 7 p.m. in South Boston. Oh, awesome. I didn't even know it was on the calendar <laughs> yet. So there you go. October 7th. We'll see you in uh, three weeks or a little, a little more than three weeks. Yep. <laughs> see ya. All right. See everyone later. Thanks for tuning in.